And some, pe- some preachers actually look at that verse and, in a negative way, and I don't know. Here's the whole thing in a nutshell. God created this world to come to an end one day. And if this is those days, then Jesus wants to come when he returns and find us doing what he called us to do. And that's our job. There's no room for complacency because we're depressed or because we see our nation, you know, going the way it's going. We need to be workers. David became king of Israel. They were coming to him and trying to get him to be afraid. And he said, I'm not going to be afraid. God is still on the throne. Last time I checked, he is. And so Brother Dan Charlin has dedicated his life and his ministry to teach and reteach the foundations of this country were established on the word of God. And that's how it started. And they've done everything to try to turn us away from that. But he's going to come and he's going to share with us. What can the righteous do? Well, I want to tell you, we can pray. We can come together and witness. Uh, We come together as a church and then go out and witness to those who are lost. And perhaps God will send a revival. And so, Father, we just love you. We pray that you take this service for your glory. And, Lord, that we would be encouraged because you still are on the throne. And, Lord, no one knows except you what the outcome of all this is. And so, Lord, either way, we're your people. And we want to act and live and be according uh, to, that, to that name, to, to your name, Lord, your people. And so, Father, I pray for De- Brother Dan. Uh, feel him, use him, and we give you all the credit and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. You would welcome Brother Dan Charlie. Does that look right? Can you hear me? Through this, I mean. <laughs> Praise the Lord. It, yeah, the green light's on. You might want to turn it up. I, I asked you to pray for me because uh, last time I was preaching, I lost my voice a little bit. Now, I think maybe some people were praying about that. I don't know <laughs> what, but uh, I have acid reflux, so some, and I'm trying to figure that out and how to, how to tackle that, but... Uh, Anyways, pray, pray for me that I don't lose my voice, but before I get right into the message, first of all, I apologize for the mask and the social distancing. How many of you remember when me and my wife and kids were here last time? Praise the Lord. The boys are all grown up. They're still living at home, but because of this virus, and I think I told you last time, my wife has an immune system deficiency, so we're not traveling to churches as, as a family. She traveled with me, but she has to stay in the van. We're trying to limit her exposure. I had COVID in October. It was an absolute miracle that she did not get it, but because of her health condition, we're being very careful. So I apologize for the mask. I apologize for the social distancing. You know, when you're always shaking hands and, and getting together, I felt like a fish out of water because I like to get involved there and shake hands. So, And also, when you, you, you might notice when I came in here, I was running around like a chicken with my head cut off. The last time I came, I had three sons who brought a lot of stuff in, and now I've got double the stuff. So uh, it was just kind of crazy. So I, I, I'm really not an unfriendly guy. I'm really not, you know. Uh, Lord willing, you'll have us back. My wife will come in. You'll have some beauty, okay? And uh, we can shake hands and not worry about all this coronavirus business. But I just wanted to say that, and I apologize for the inconvenience. Uh, But before we get right into the message, I want to go over who we are real quick. Uh, Can everybody see this okay? Praise the Lord. We're Daniel Sherlin Ministries. That's my beautiful wife, Jennifer, and that's me. Actually, it's not me. It's a picture of me. Okay, there we go. And uh, we're missionaries to the United States, that out of Calvary Baptist Church in Eskish Junction, Vermont. That's what our church looks like there in Vermont. 
In September of 2013, we stepped out in faith with no monthly support. I quit my secular job, resigned from the interim pastor I held for a year and a half, and we sold our house in four days. And from 2013 through 2019, our three sons worked with us in the ministry. That's when we first started in 2013, little Ethan, Jeremy, and Joseph. And they continued with us through uh, 2018, one of our last presentations together. And there's big Ethan, big Jeremy, and big Joseph. And, they're e and Ethan's even bigger still. So God has provided for the work through the generous giving of churches and individuals who love Christ and love America. We've, we've ministered in hundreds of churches all over the United States. We've ministered in dozens of schools, and we've seen over 1,100 people accept Christ as their Savior. So God has richly blessed our ministry. We praise him for that. Amen. So we are educating Christians about our nation's Christian heritage and the resulting Christian consensus, helping Christians understand why America lost the Christian consensus and explain the proper Christian response. So we do this through our living history presentations, which we did for you last time. We have many others. We have Faith of Our Founding Fathers, which you saw last time, the Founding Fathers in America's Present Crisis, the Founding Fathers in Christianity, and many more. Visit our website to see all the living history presentations we do. We also have a huge children's selection of ministries. If you ever want us to come for a children's presentation or VBS, we have a great program for that. We see kids saved all the time. PowerPoint presentations, America's Christian Heritage and the way things are today, I'll be doing that for you this morning. Introduction to Devilisms, very powerful presentation. And year in review series and American Christians in politics. That's one I developed about a year and a half ago for the last election. Unfortunately, with the coronavirus and everything that happened, I wasn't able to get this message out to as many people as I would have hoped to. But it's going to be good for the mid-year, uh, mid-cycle election. So we'll be still doing that. And I'm presently working on a, uh, the introduction to devilisms. We cover many of the uh, ideologies Satan's using to destroy our nation. And I'm, so out of, the, out of the intro to devilisms, I'm taking those individual devilisms and creating entire presentations on them. The first one I'm doing is introduction to Marxism. If you know anything about Marxism and what's happening in our nation, you'll see how important that is right now. So please pray for our ministry and family and take a prayer card before you leave. We have a table set up out there. And sign up for our e-newsletter. And you can go to our website. We also have it listed on our uh, prayer card, so you can grab one of those. And if you just Google my name, Daniel Charlin Ministries, it usually comes right up. That's uh, called Search Engine Optimization, and I didn't pay a penny for it. The Lord did that through Google for me. So, this message, America's Christian Heritage and the Way Things Are Today. Hmm? No, that, I got plenty. Thank you very much. May, ask me on the way out, though. <laughs> All right, praise the Lord. Now, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come to this church, uh, these blessed saints who have invited me back. What a, what a privilege and an honor, Father. I thank you for that. Lord, I pray you'll bless this presentation, this hour. Help me to be empty of self and filled with your spirit. We pray that Christ will be magnified. We pray that if there's any here that did not know Christ, they will receive him today. And those who do know Christ, we pray they'll leave here with a, a heart attitude dedicated to serving you with their whole heart. We ask Christ to be magnified, keep a hedge of protection around this place, strengthen my voice, and help people to be attentive with their hearts and minds, Father. Help Christ to be magnified above all things. In Jesus' name, amen. I can't remember if I have a little snippet, like three or four slides down that says pray, but just in case, I prayed there, okay? <laughs> okay, the daily headlines tell the story. America is a nation in crisis. Horrific crimes, racial tensions, political corruption. By the way, if you agree with anything I say today, you can say amen. amen. And if you disagree, you have the right to remain silent. <laughs> I used to be a peace officer before I was a teacher, so... Sexual immorality, chaos, and confusion rule the land. Our nation's schools are not exempt. Columbine, hard to believe it's been over 20 years since that first mass murder in, in our public schools. And then a couple years ago, Parkland in Florida. Just 60 years ago, violence in schools was not a problem. In fact, students drove to school with their hunting rifles hanging in the windows of their pickup trucks with the door unlocked and the, and the 3030 was loaded. There were school rifle clubs that were common, like this one at Tottenville High School in Staten Island, New York in 1947. Can anybody tell me what major city Staten Island is a part of? 
New York City, a student rifle club. During the 2015-2016 school year, there were 1,049,200 serious offenses in our nation's public schools. Physical attacks and threat of attacks, robbery, sexual assault and rape, weapons possession, and the violence impacts every segment of society. Prior to 1983, there was no such thing as a safety seal on products. How many of you remember those days? So you see a safety seal in the picture there. You know, we used to bring, a, there was a bottle of Tylenol sitting on the, on the counter at the store. It didn't even, it didn't even have a box. And you brought it home, took the lid off, and there were the pills. Now they got the safety seal, a plastic seal over that, and it's in a sealed box. Imagine living in a world where you don't have to worry about somebody wanting to poison you. It was like that until 1982 when a murderer laced Tylenol capsules with cyanide in Chicago. Seven people, including a 12-year-old girl, were killed. All over the nation, Tylenol was removed from store shelves to stop the panic. I think I was a, I was a sophomore in high school at that time. I remember my mom going through the cupboard and cleaning out all the Tylenol products. You got, anybody remember that? I mean, there was a panic all over the United States. If it said Tylenol on it, you threw it in the trash. Nobody knew exactly what was going on. And sadly, hundreds of copycat attacks occurred all over the country as well. People got the sick idea from this guy and decided to go out and try and poison people themselves. In 1983, Congress passed a Tylenol bill making it a crime to tamper with consumer products. And in 1989, the FDA established a federal guidelines requiring products to be tamper-proof. That's a federal law now. So what changed in America? How did we go from school shooting clubs to mass murder? How did we go from safety and consumer products to mass murder? That's an actual picture of the family that lost, of those seven, there was one family, I think they lost four people in that one family. That's the funeral where they had all the caskets. Very sad. Ladies and gentlemen, in America, the truth has been censored. And that's why God has called me to this ministry. We're going to learn today what the Founding Fathers believed and what changed in America. Largely ignored by educators today is the Christian worldview held by the Founding Fathers and the vast majority of Americans in the 18th century. Regarding the Bible, they believe the following. It's the Word of God. It has absolute truth. In fact, the Bible is the only source of absolute truth. It gives God's directions for life, and I mean everything. How to have a good marriage, how to have a good family, how to be a good employee, how to be a good employer. You name it, God's Word gives us directions for life. Helps us to understand justice and judgment. You know why there's so much chaos in America today? Because Americans do not understand what justice and judgment are. It prepares man to meet his maker, and it tells us the consequences for violating God's laws. John Adams, our second president, said, The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. In other words, our Republican foundation is Christianity. John Dickinson, sign of the Constitution, said, Governments cannot give the rights essential to happiness. We claim them from a higher source, from the King of kings and Lord of all the earth. Not just God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. A specific God, folks. How many times do you hear people say today, oh, we all worship the same God. A, no, we do not. And B, it's the Christian God that gave us our liberty. And I know that for many reasons, not the least of which is if I go to these other countries with, the other, with these other gods, you have no rights. Okay, go preach the gospel in, in Mecca. See how long you, you'll last. Thomas Jefferson, third president, said, Indeed, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and his justice cannot sleep forever. He was not a deist, by the way, folks. James McHenry, signed of the Constitution, said, Bibles are strong protections. Where they abound, men cannot pursue wicked courses and at the same time enjoy quiet conscience. In other words, with the word of God is proclaimed, it's not so easy to live in sin. Why do you think they've taken Christianity out of the public schools, out of our government, out of Hollywood, and every other aspect of our life? Because they don't want to hear the truth. Jesus, Jesus said, the light shined in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Governor Morris, signed the Constitution, said, There must be religion. When that ligament is torn, society is disjointed and its members perish. By the way, whenever the Founding Fathers used the term religion, they were always talking about Christianity. 
That's not an opinion. You can go back and check. Noah Webster, schoolmaster to America, said, the Christian religion must be the basis of any government intended to secure the rights and privileges of a free people. Another founding father telling it like it is, our rights come from God, specifically from the Lord Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news, and the majority of the founding fathers believed it. So here's a summary of the gospel. By the way, I'm going to share the gospel with you right now, then I'm going to give an in-your-seat invitation. But don't get excited, it's not a 10-minute sermon, we're just barely getting started, okay? So why would you give the invitation at the beginning of the sermon, Brother Dan? Well, when you see how the rest of this goes, you'll understand completely. But here we go. Here's the gospel. So if you're a Christian, I would encourage you to write these verses down so you can share them with others. And if you have never accepted Christ as your personal Savior, I would encourage you to pay attention because I'm going to share with you right now, listen, how you can be 100% sure you're going to heaven when you die. The most important part of this message or any other message you'll ever hear is the gospel. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. But so few people are taught anything about the truth today, a lot of people don't even really understand what sin is. 1 John 3.4, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is a transgression of the law. Okay? Now, the law is given in the Old Testament as 613 precepts. How many of you memorize all 613? Oh, no. Okay, well, we're all familiar with the top 10, and we call those 10 commandments. Even the most irreligious person in America has heard of the 10 commandments. So we need to take, pe before we can take people to, to uh, Mount Calvary, folks, we got to take them to Mount Sinai. They have to understand that they have broken God's law. Okay, what do I need a Savior for? Because you've broken God's law. So let's take them to Mount, Mount uh, Sinai here. Ten Commandments. Now the first, the first four deal with our relationship with God. Okay? And the last six deal with our relationship with each other. So, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay? Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now the second half, or the other six, I should say, of our, our relationship with each other. Honor thy father and thy mother. Look how high God puts that on this list. Even above, thou shalt not kill. And by the way, that's talking about murder, okay? Sometimes killing is necessary. Like in a just war, self-defense. Somebody breaks in your house, tries to rape your wife and massacre your family, you can kill that person, that's justified, okay? This means you should not murder, okay? Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, and thou shalt not covet. See, all these deal with the heart issues. God looks on the heart, okay? If we, guard, if we guard our heart against these things, we'll be less apt to actually do them, okay? Uh, but in any event, how many of you can say here that I have never violated a single one of these? Anybody? Well, that's good. I give people the good person test. Uh, I may have done that when I was here last time. Ray Cumpert and uh, Kirk Cameron do this in their way of the master, okay? So... How many of you would consider yourselves a good person? Everybody raise your hand because everybody really thinks they're a good person. Come on. Don't, don't lie to me. Okay. We haven't gotten to that part yet. Okay. So how many of you have told a lie before? Raise your hand. Come on. Some of you are lying right now. Okay. What do we call somebody that lies? A liar. Okay. How many of you have stolen something before? Raise your hand. Come on. You just admitted you were a liar a minute ago. We've all, lied, we've all lied and we've all stolen. What do you call somebody that steals? Okay? How many of you have taken the Lord's name in vain before? That's hard to admit, but we have. Yeah, that's called blasphemy. And the Bible says God will not hold him guiltless that taken his name in vain. So you consider yourself a good person. We've only gone through three of the Ten Commandments, and you've already violated all three. And, we, and if we kept going, you'd have to admit you violated all ten. So I never committed adultery. Jesus said if you lust upon a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery. Well, I've never murdered somebody. Jesus said, if you hate your brother, you've committed murder. Okay? So we violate all ten of these. Okay? By your own admission, you're a lying, thieving, blasphemer at heart. On the day of judgment, when God judges you by his ten commandments, will he find you innocent or guilty? See, I can approach anybody on the street in a cordial manner and share this with them, and now they're convicted of their sin. Now they know they're lost. And we need to explain to them the wages of sin is death. Okay? And death in the Bible means separation. Physical death means your soul and spirit depart from the body. The cemetery is filled with people who have 
experience physical death. But that's not what 623 is talking about. It's talking about spiritual death, eternal separation from God and hell forever. Hell is a place of fire and torment. It's a place of darkness. By the way, it can be fire and dark at the same time because scientists have, dis have uh, concluded that the color of the hottest fire that could possibly burn is pitch black. Think of the black holes in outer space. Worst of all, though, hell is a place where you're forever separated from the presence of God. You know, even the most wicked person while they're alive on planet Earth is, is enjoying a certain sense of peace and comfort and security because they're in God's presence that they will not experience when they die in their sins and go to hell. Think of the scariest, most horrific time of your life. That would seem like a good day compared to being in hell. So, the wages of sin is death means because you're a sinner, and we are, you have earned death. Wages are something you earn. You have earned death. What does that mean? It means when you die, you are going to a devil's hell. Okay? So why is the gospel considered good news? Why did the founding fathers embrace it? Because the second part of Romans 6.23 says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God has a gift for you. Do you pay for a gift? No, it's free. What is that gift? Eternal life. That's talking about a home in heaven with God forever. How? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus said, I am the door. In order to get to heaven, you've got to go through him. John 3.16 tells us, God so loved the world, that includes you, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. The next verse says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he, God the Father, hath made him God the Son, for he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You know, the moment you turn away from your sin against God, I'm not talking about cleaning up your life. You can't do that. Sin is a hard attitude, amen? Sin is rebellion against God. When we sin, it's like shaking our fist in God's face. That's a hard attitude. When Jesus says repent, he's not saying, you've got to give up all your sins before you come to me. That's not repent. What repent. It means... That hard attitude of rebellion against God, you've got to be willing to turn away from that hard attitude. And then where do you, where do you, turn? When you turn? When you turn away from this, where do you turn? Jesus is sitting there like this saying, come on, I'm waiting for you. Repent of your heart attitude of rebellion against God and give your life to Jesus Christ. The moment you believe on him as your Savior, the Bible says he takes your sins, nails them to the cross with Jesus. He takes Christ's righteousness and he places it on you. That's called an imputed righteousness. What does it mean? It's a legal term. It means you're not righteous in and of yourself, but because you've accepted Christ as your personal Savior, trusting him to take you to heaven, not your good works, the Bible says at that moment you're quickened, you're made alive, you're made righteous by the blood of Christ. It's as though God took a holy blanket and covered you with it. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin anymore. He sees the blood of Christ. When you die, you won't die in your sins. You'll die cleansed by the blood of Christ. And he can let you in because you're as holy as Jesus. Why? Because what Jesus did is imputed into your account. That's the faith transaction that takes place. You trade your sins to God, he gives the righteousness of Christ to you. That's what this verse is saying, folks. Ephesians 1, 7, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The blood of Christ cleanses us from all unrighteousness. First uh, John 1 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you become a child of God. That's why Jesus called it being born again. You had a physical birth, but you need a spiritual birth. So keeping the Ten Commandments, going to church, getting baptized, all that, those are works that cannot save us. Nothing you do can contribute to your salvation. Nothing. Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. The moment you turn from that rebellion against God and accept Christ to save you from hell, save you from your sins, you're quickened, you're made alive, God declares you're righteous, and he puts the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, in your heart, your body. He, he's in you, and he can give you the strength to live for God. If you're a lost sinner who's never accepted Christ, you may have tried to reform your life. You've tried over and over again not to sin. You've been powerless. You keep failing. As a Christian who's yielded his life to Christ, the Holy Spirit can give you the power to live for God. It's not you cleaning up your life. It's the Holy Spirit, God within you, cleaning up your life for you. It requires a yielded heart. You can still sin as a Christian. But if you yield your heart to Christ, God will give you the power. That's, that's miraculous, folks. 
So how do I receive this gift? I'm glad you asked. You're asking all the right questions this morning. Romans 10, 9 and 10 and 13, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The moment you turn from that heart rebellion and accept Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to pay your sin debt in full, the moment you do that, you're quickened, you're made alive. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What about you? Have you ever accepted Jesus? Christ is your personal Savior? Have you ever came to a place in your life where you realize you're a sinner and you deserve hell? And you said, Lord, I want to turn away from that, that hard attitude. I want to trust Jesus who died on the cross and paid my sin. I want to trust him to save me, and I'm going to do that right now. If you've never done that, I'm going to give you an opportunity. You know, I, I may have told you last time we have a fair ministry. We set up a soul winning booth at the fair. We give, this, we give the gospel to people. And after I give the gospel, I'll say to somebody, now that you've heard the gospel and you know how to be saved, let me ask you a question. Would you like to be saved? And more often than not, they'll say, yes, I would. They'll say, then you could pray a prayer like this. Listen very careful. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I know my good works cannot save me. My good works can't take away my sins. But I believe Jesus Christ is God the Son. He became a man. He lived a perfect life and never sinned. I believe he died on the cross and shed his blood to wash away my sins and pay my sin debt in full. I believe he was buried and rose again, like the Bible says, proving he is God and what he said is true. And Lord, I'm sorry for my rebellion, my hard attitude against you. I ask you to forgive me. Come into my life. Be my Savior. I trust you to save me and take me to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. We call that the sinner's prayer. Or ver that's one version of it. Mine is very complete and thorough, you might notice. I don't like to leave any stone unturned when it comes to leading somebody to the Lord. Now, you could pray that prayer with me right now, but I want you to know two things about that prayer. Number one, you could pray that prayer a million times and still die and go to hell. Why is that? Because the prayer doesn't save you. Your faith saves you. That prayer is just a way to tell God how you're feeling. And number two, if you're already a Christian, if you've already been born again, you don't need to say that prayer. That prayer is only for the lost, those who have never trusted Christ. So just in case there's somebody in here who has never done that, I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. I'm going to lead you in that prayer. I'm going to go much more slowly so you can repeat it after me. You can say it out loud or you can say it in your heart to God. He hears your thoughts. But if you would like to pray and trust Jesus to be your Savior, pray with me now. I'd like to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. Nobody looking around. If you'd like to trust Jesus to save you and you'd like to become a Christian, pray this prayer with me now. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell. I know my good works cannot save me. But I believe Jesus Christ is God the Son, that he became a man and lived a perfect life. He never sinned. I believe he died on the cross and shed his blood to pay my sin debt in full. I believe he was buried that he rose again the third day, proving he is God and what he said is true. Lord, I'm sorry for my rebellion and violating your law. Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life and be my Savior. Take me to heaven when I die. Thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to ask you to keep your head bowed and eyes closed. I heard somebody praying that prayer, and praise God for it. I'd like to ask you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, would you please lift up your hand? I, I, I'm not going to point out who you are. I see one hand. Anybody else pray that prayer? Anybody else? I see two more hands, three more hands. Uh, just keep your hands up there for a moment. Where's Pastor? Can you see the hands, brother? Okay, I see four. Four hands. Thank you. Put your hands down. I'm going to ask God to bless your life. You're now a Christian. Praise God, church. Four more people are going to heaven when they die. I want to pray for these people. I'll not point you out. You raise your hand before me and the pastor. Praise God for that. I'm going to pray. Let's pray for them right now. Father, I praise your name and thank you for this opportunity to share your gospel. And I praise your name, Father God, for these four who have accepted Jesus as their Savior. Lord, I thank you for that one who boldly prayed out loud. But I thank you for all four of these 
now they're saints. They're children of God. Praise you and thank you for that, Father. Help them to grow in Christ now. Help them to yield their lives fully to Christ so that they can grow as Christians. Help them to make a public profession of faith and share with the church, hey, I'm one of those people who have prayed so we can rejoice with them, Father. Lord, move in their hearts to pray every day. That's how they talk to you. And move in their hearts to read the Bible every day. That's how you talk to them. I ask your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, folks, there's, the reason I do this in, in the, the early part of the service is because Saved by faith was at the heart of the Protestant doctrine brought to the American colonies by the English settlers. What we just share with you is what the vast majority of Americans believed in the 1600s and 1700s and even in the 1800s. 18th century Americans believed they must obey the Ten Commandments, not to be saved, but to please God once they were saved. Most Americans believed in living in accordance with the Ten Commandments, in fact, all the way up through the early 1960s. That was a common American thought. 20th century theologian Francis Schaeffer referred to this as the Christian consensus. In other words, even in America, even those people who weren't truly born again in public, they acted like they were. It was a Christian culture. So we had a Christian consensus, a Christian worldview. The Christian consensus started with the Founding Fathers. For example, did you know the Founding Fathers believed the Bible should be taught in public schools? Benjamin Rush said, the Bible should be read in our schools in preference to all other books. Noah Webster said, Our citizens should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican principles is the Bible. And Governor Morris said, Education should teach the precepts of religion and the duties of man toward God. Imagine all this stuff taught in public schools all the way up to the 1960s, folks. So why is the Bible banned as a textbook in American schools today? Separation of church and state. <clears throat> Big wall. Now, I touched on this very briefly last time I was here, and I told you, I'm sorry I can only touch on this very briefly. Do you remember that? Well, now I'm not going to touch on it very briefly. I'm going to go into detail. The phrase has been used to ban Christianity from the nation's public schools. So let's take a poll. Where does the phrase separation of church and state appear? I want to see a show of hands here. How many of you say it's in the Declaration of Independence? Raise your hands. Okay, there's a few, few there. Okay. How many of you say it's in the Constitution? Raise your hands. Okay, some more. How about the Bill of Rights? Is it in the Bill of Rights? Raise your hands. How about some other formal document written by our founding fathers? Is there any, any other formal document? Okay, so we probably have about eight or nine, ten people all together raising their hands here. But actually, it does not appear in any of our nation's foundational documents. Not one. October 7, 1801, the Danbury Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, wrote a letter to President Thomas Jefferson. They were concerned that the First Amendment might be interpreted to imply that the freedom of religion was a right granted by government when it was really a gift from God himself. In other words, it was inalienable that is, God-given and unalterable. Well, President Jefferson assured them that he agreed with their views of the dangers of power and government, and a wall of separation was in place, listen, to protect the church from the state. Did you see that? Jefferson used the phrase because Roger Williams, a 17th century Baptist minister from Rhode Island, had also used the phrase. Williams had taught that government had no business meddling in the affairs of the church and had no right to compel any man to worship God in any particular way. If you study the history of Roger Williams, who was the founder of the colony of Rhode Island, he was banished from the other colonies for not wanting to pay the Anglican tax, church tax. You know, those other colonies had a, had a rule that you had to pay to support the state religion, which was the Church of England at that time. And he refused to do it. That's why he was banished and started the colony of Rhode Island, the freest colony that existed. Pennsylvania, founded by William Penn, was very close behind that. As originally conceived, however, separation of church and state meant that the state had to keep out of the church, not that Christians could not influence the government. It was a one-way street, folks. Well, that's just your opinion. Oh, no, no. This is John Jay. Anybody know who John Jay was? John Jay was the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. Who's the Supreme Court Chief Justice today? John Roberts, okay? You could not get two different Johns if you tried, okay? 
Listen to what the first Supreme Court Chief Justice told Americans. Listen, imagine John Roberts going out on CNN and giving a press conference and saying this. Listen, Providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers, and it is the duty as well as the privilege and interest of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Separation of church and state, they fully expected Christians to serve and rule in our nation. But separation of church and state meant that the state could not interfere with the church. Not the other way around. As, as, as I'm just proving to you right here with a single quote, and you can find many, many more. This is one of the most powerful. Okay, they, The founding fathers fully expected Christians to rule in our government. In fact, Jefferson almost didn't get elected because he wasn't a uh, traditional Christian, if you will. He, I mean, he wasn't a Christian, but I mean, he claimed to be a Christian because he followed the, the teachings of Jesus, but he wasn't truly born again. He didn't believe in the miracles. Of, he wrote his own Bible, took all the miracles out. Okay, uh, So people, people in, in the Founding Father's Day and Age almost opposed Jefferson's running for office because he wasn't a professed Christian. Here's from the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That means, folks, it's a no-brainer. <laughs> That's like 21st century terminology. We hold these truths to be a no-brainer, okay? That all men are evolved equal. Oh, no, it doesn't say that? Okay. Created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Okay, so here we are again. Where our rights come from God, not government. Amen? By the way, if government can give us our rights, what can government also do? Okay? Now, they took the Bible out of public schools, and guess what they've been teaching our kids? Rights come from government. Why are we seeing the American people just roll over like dead sheep whenever the government passes oppressive laws? Because they've been taught that it's okay. I want you to think about that. We have not taught our kids that rights come from God since the early 1960s when the Bible was removed from school. They have been taught that the state is the sovereign authority in their lives. The same teaching that was taught in communist Russia and communist China and all the other wicked nations around the world. That's what your kids are being taught in public schools, by the way. So where do we learn of these God-given rights? The Bible. Life thou shalt not kill. Liberty, God gives us a free will to obey him or to sin, and property thou shalt not steal. Remember, America was founded on Christian principles. We had a Christian consensus and Christian virtues. In God we trust. What changed in America? Humanism, that's one of the devilisms, by the way. Man is the highest being, there is no God. It's a secular or non-religious view of the world. See how the Bible's crossed out there? With humanism, there are no divine revelations from anywheres. Man can only look for truth starting from himself. With no acknowledgement or belief in any divine revelation, the Bible is not allowed in the humanist worldview, folks. Several proponents of humanist thought emerged with three in particular having a huge impact on American society. How many of you know who this first guy is? If you know, just blurt it out. Karl Marx, how about this? Ah, I tricked you on that one. Picture a guy with a big fuzzy beard. Darwin. And I'll bet nobody knows who this guy is. I went to a teacher's college in Vermont where they just about worshiped the ground that guy worked on. In fact, he's buried at the University of Vermont, the only body interned at the university. We'll find out who he is in just a moment. But they have some common goals. Replace the Christian consensus with a humanist worldview. Now, as we go through this, I want you to be thinking in your mind, how successful have they been? What is America like today? Re they wanted to replace the traditional family with the collective or the state. Ever heard of the book, It Takes a Village? Who wrote that book? Hillary Clinton replaced private ownership of property with state ownership of property and replaced absolute truth with relative truth. 
Now, we need to talk more about relative truth. I, mentioned, I went over this very briefly when I was here last time. And relativism is one of the devilisms. In fact, it's the foundational devilism. If you understand relative truth and relativism, you'll understand a lot more about all those devilisms that Satan is using to destroy the world, in America in particular. See, with relative truth, society or the elites in government determine good and evil, right and wrong. It not only changes over time, but contradictions occur very frequently. Confused? By design. In 2002, Scott Peterson murdered his pregnant wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. How many of you remember seeing that on the news? I was teaching in the Bay Area at the time. That was on the local news. I lived out there. He was convicted of a double homicide. Are you with me on that? Double homicide. At the same time, it was perfectly legal to have an abortion in California, and it still is. So I want you to think about this, folks. If a woman wants to keep her baby, it is considered a human being, and anyone who kills the baby is a murderer. If a woman wants an abortion, it is no longer a human being. It is a blob of tissue. Such contradictions in legal doublespeak are the result of relative truth. Listen, this kind of stuff exists all through our legal system. I was a probation officer in California for just about a year. I saw this stuff all the time. I remember one case I worked on. This 18-year-old kid had had relations with a 14-year-old or, or something like that, or they were both younger at the time, whatever. So that was against the law, okay? But at the same time, in public schools in California, they were handing out contraception and, and, and teaching sex ed with no, no morals, no values, and, and in essence, encouraging the kids to go out and do it. So they, they, they tell you how to do it, and they give you the, the means to do it, and then when they go out and do it, they put them in jail. In 2019, New York passed a law allowing for abortion up through the birth of the child. Other states are doing the same. God's word declares in Exodus 21, verses 22 and 23, quote, If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, thou shalt give life for life. Let me, let me give you the uh, quick uh, 21st century interpretation here. If a couple of men are getting into a fight or something, they accidentally hit a pregnant woman, and... and, and the baby is, is miscarried. If the baby lives, those guys are in trouble. They're going to pay some fines. They're in trouble, okay? If the baby dies, those two guys are going to be put to death. Let me, let me say it even more clearly. The death penalty for an accidental abortion. If you study Scripture, it does, it's not hard to see that God considers an unborn child a human being. Now, I, I want to say something right now. There may be a woman here who has had an abortion. I want you to know two things. Number one, God loves you. He died on the cross to save you from your sin. Number two, if you'll receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, not only will that sin be forgiven, but your child will greet you in heaven someday and forgive you. Now that we have an understanding of what humanism and relative truth are, let's take a look at the three men as Satan used to help destroy the Christian consensus in America. Number one is Karl Marx, a German philosopher, economist, historian, political theorist, sociologist, journalist, and revolutionary socialist. He provided the philosophical framework for the move away from the Christian consensus. He gave us Marxism, the Communist Manifesto in 1848, he advocated collectivism, that's the group. Individuals have no rights, only the state or the collective matters. The offspring of Marxist philosophy are socialism and communism, two of the other devilisms I talk about in Introduction to Devilisms. With socialism, there's some private ownership, but with full state control. Private property is limited with state control over education, healthcare, industry, and so forth. Through democracy, People vote to become socialists by degrees, like the United States is doing. 
They lie, the media lies, man manipulates the facts, and gets people to fall for this garbage, and they end up going to the voting booth and voting for the very politicians who are going to enslave them. We saw that this last election. I have a strong opinion about that. Does anybody want to hear it? If I'm going to offend you, I'll be quiet. Because I'm not here, I'm not here, okay? Based on what I've seen in my study of the facts, that election was stolen. Amen. But God is sovereign. He knew it was going to happen, and he let it happen. So just that, that, ought, to get, that ought to give Christians some pause. What is God doing? Okay, he's doing something. This presentation is going to help you understand more why he's doing what he's doing. Nazi Germany was actually a socialist state, folks, under the control of a fascist dictator, Adolf Hitler. In fact, the word Nazi means National Socialist German Workers' Party. But because the political left in America likes to identify the political right with Hitler, they say Hitler wasn't really a socialist. That is a blatant, flat-out lie. Yes, Hitler was a nationalist. He was pro-Germany, obviously, all right? But he was a socialist. Using relative truth, Germany redefined person to exclude Jews. Jews in Germany were legally not people. So that would never happen in America. 1973, Roe versus Wade. By the way, Hitler killed his 12 million. We've killed our 70 million. Six million Jews were legally killed in concentration camps, folks. They weren't murdered. Think about this. Those six million Jews were not murdered. They were exterminated. They were, they were vermin to be exterminated. That's the law. Well, how do we get to a law like that? Two words, RT, relative truth. By the way, we hear all about the, 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 the six million uh, Jews, and that's horrific, but we rarely hear about the six million Christians and gypsies who were also killed. Communism, usually introduced by force like the, so by force like the Soviet Union, Communist China, North Korea, Cuba, etc. With communism, you have full state control and ownership over everything and everyone. Political opponents are killed or sent to labor camps. The communist leader of Cambodia, Pol Pot, murdered over one million political opponents in what became known as the killing fields. This is known as the killing tree right here. Okay? They took children and bashed their heads against this tree to exterminate when Pol Pot invaded in Vietnam. By the way, the Soviet Union was behind the demonstrations in the United States during the 1960s. These were communist-inspired rallies that became such a hot-button political issue that our politicians buckled and pulled our troops out of Vietnam, enabling Pol Pot to do this. By the way, what I'm saying is not theory, it's fact. Even Facebook acknowledged that the communists in America during the 60s were behind all those riots and protests. By the way, guess who's behind all of it now? I first showed this presentation at a public school in Louisiana about two and a half years ago. In fact, I, I've modified it quite a bit, but this presentation was initially presented for a public high school. And when I talked about this killing tree and the kids being bat, their heads bashed against the bat, the, the, you know, the, the, the tree, there were several boys in the back of the auditorium that laughed when I said that. The Bible Belt, folks. We're in, that, that's the Bible Belt. The buckle of the Bible Belt. That's the kind of kids we have in public schools. Marxism's legacy in communist countries during the 20th century alone. Over 100 million people were murdered by their own governments for opposing Marxism. And in my studies and research, it's probably closer to 160 million people murdered in the 20th century. That doesn't count the last 21 years in China and North Korea and Cuba. Our next dastardly character is Charles Darwin. By the way, I'm doing that presentation on Marxism I told you about. And the more research I do on Marx, the more disgusting it becomes. But that's for another day. Charles Darwin was an English naturalist, geologist, and biologist, best known for his contributions to the quote-unquote science of evolution. He wrote on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races and the struggles for life. He was a racist. 
And evolution is a racist theory, folks. Darwin's model replaced God with naturalism. In other words, everything happens through nature. Here's the, listen, here's the formula for evolution. I'm going to be going over time. I hope you'll forgive me. I hope you're enjoying this. I mean, this, this stuff. Uh, but naturalism gives you a formula for how we got here. It's this. Nothing plus time plus chance equals everything. Think about that. Next time you get into debate, creation versus evolution, ask them what they believe. You know, most of them don't even know what they believe. And say, let me tell you what you believe. You believe that nothing plus time plus chance equals everything. That's what you believe. I believe in the beginning God created. And these guys say that I have faith. This had profound impacts upon the world, ladies and gentlemen. We went from this to this. Elites in education, science, government, the media, and Hollywood embraced Darwin's model and mocked the biblical account in Genesis. Here are some of the effects on societies embracing Darwin's model. Relative truth has replaced absolute truth. After all, if there is no God, there are no absolutes. Right? We can make up truth. There's a loss of respect for human life. How has this been demonstrated in practical ways? Increased violence, abortion, infanticide. We're killing babies now after they're born. Euthanasia. The old people, oh, we don't need them anymore. They're not useful to the collective, to society. Just take them down the hall and put them in the gas chamber. You, th you think that's science fiction? You think that's not far off from where we are? Loss of respect for individual rights. That ought to be plain to you, amen? Animal rights activism. Listen, you can, you can murder an unborn baby, and the police will go there to help get you into the clinic. You kill an eagle's egg, they'll put you in jail and fine you thousands of dollars. Man's reason via psychology has replaced the Bible in deciding right and wrong. You know, 30 years ago, the psychological fields considered homosexuality a mental defect. Now, not only are they embracing it, but that those same institutions are saying that pedophilia is a legitimate form of sexual expression. What changed, folks? Did the truth change? You see what relativism does? It's a slippery slope. In each world, society, or culture is of equal value, relative truth. In other words, the head-hunting society of South America where they cook you and eat you is no, is no worse than the United States. We don't have the right to judge. That's, this, that's what we're talking about. Hitler believed that by murdering the Jews, he was helping evolution by getting rid of inferior races. During the Columbine shooting, during the attack, Eric Harris was wearing a T-shirt that read Natural Selection. These guys are huge fans of Darwin and Hitler. And in fact, they both were believers in Darwinian evolution, as indicated by the videos and website Harris published. You know this, they publish all kinds of stuff praising Hitler and praising Darwin and saying that that was their motivation. And you know what got blamed for that crime? Guns. They violated 20-some-odd gun laws when they went in there and did what they did. Would one more gun law have stopped them? Give me a break. You know, I, I, like, uh, I like that, uh, you know, those tires, those tire covers, they have sayings on them and stuff. There was one tire cover that said, uh, blaming guns for Columbine is like blaming spoons for Rosie O'Donnell being fat. <laughs> Think about that, right? <laughs> Regarding Darwin's book on the origins, Marx wrote to Frederick Engels on December 19th, 1860, this is the book which contains the basis in natural history for our view. See, Marx came out with his Communist Manifesto first. About 11 years later, Darwin came out with his, with his book, and Marx read Darwin's book, and he goes, that nailed it! <laughs> that nailed it. John Dewey is our third character. How many of you knew that John Dewey was? Okay, he is, he is the hero of modern public education. And I know because in the 90s when I was going through teachers a, a public school teacher's college, John State College of Vermont, this guy was worshipped. 
He was an American philosopher, psychologist, educational reformer, whose ideas have had great influence on education and social reform. Marx provided humanists with a political and economic system. Darwin provided a seemingly scientific foundation for humanism. Humanists needed a way to get Americans to reject the Christian consensus and embrace uh, humanism. And John Dewey was the man with a plan. He's known as the father of modern education. He was a social engineer. He believed that socialism is the future. His self-appointed mission was to implement the transition to this brave new world. All of his grand theories, his scores of books, his hundreds of articles can be summed up as a program for making America socialist. He helped lead a humanist movement called progressivism. How many of you heard of progressivism? Progressive movement, right? Their goals were to change society through public education, embrace collectivism over individualism, promote Marxist economic practices instead of free enterprise or capitalism. By the way, the Bible teaches free enterprise. I'm going to demonstrate that in my Marxism uh, presentation. <clears throat> and promote Darwinism over the Bible. That was their goals, folks these progressive educators. How did they do this? They took control of colleges and universities. They promoted humanism and opposed the Christian consensus. They literally rewrote history in the books. They taught that humanism is science-based while Christianity is a myth. And they educated future teachers of America's public school system. Dewey was a humanist who promoted socialism and wanted to transform America into a socialist society using the education system to indoctrinate students. Progressive professors and teachers influenced those in education, law, politics, and economics. They rewrote history books so that history was taught from a Marxist perspective. The truth was censored. By the 1960s, humanists had gained control of many of the nation's institutions, including the Supreme Court in the United States. In the 1947 Everson versus Board of Education, this is the, this is the, the court, listen to this. The First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. That wall must be kept high and impregnable. We could not approve the slightest breach. They misquoted Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist using the one phrase and ignoring the rest of the letter. They cherry-picked that phrase out of its context into their decision. They turned the meaning on its head. They lied. From the congressional records from June 7th to September 25th, 1789, not one of the 90 framers ever mentioned the phrase separation of church and state. This is while they were framing the First Amendment. So what's happened since then? 1962, Engel versus Vital, the court ruled that it is unconstitutional for state officials to compose an official school prayer and encourage its recitation in public schools. 1963, Abington School District versus Shemp, court decided eight to one in favor of the respondent, Edward Shemp, and declared school-sponsored Bible reading in public schools in the United States to be unconstitutional. This ruling, despite the fact that the Founding Fathers advocated the Bible's use in public schools, and it had been used in public schools for over 160 years. And that's just since the foundation of our republic. It was used a couple hundred years prior to that when the colonists first came over here. And you can say the same thing about school prayer. So how do we go to, it's, it's every day, everybody's doing it for 160 years. How do we go from that to it's unconstitutional? Two words, RT, relative truth. Stone versus Graham, 1980, the posting of the Ten Commandments in, in public school classrooms, unconstitutional. Wow, that's pretty remarkable, especially when you consider there's a depiction of Moses in the Ten Commandments in the Supreme Court building. Here's from a 1975 official U.S. Supreme Court handbook. If you went for a tour as a, as, a, as a tourist at the Supreme Court building, they would give you this handbook in 1975. Listen to what it says. Directly above the bench are two central figures depicting majesty of the law and power of government. Between them is a tableau of the Ten Commandments. On tours given by the Supreme Court people at the building today, here's what people are told. People are told that the tour, by the tour guides that the tablets represent the first ten amendments to the Constitution. How is that possible? Two words, RT. Okay, let me, let me, let me just play a, a leftist politician for a moment, speaking honestly. I know that's an oxymoron, but just bear with me here, okay? 
you people are all idiots, and you must sit, listen to everything I tell you and do whatever I tell you, and don't think for yourselves, just follow me. Is that pretty much summing up pretty good? In other words, folks, truth is what the government tells you it is. Wallace versus Jaffrey, 1985, a law permitting one minute for prayer or meditation was unconstitutional. If you read that decision, you'll see the reason they considered it unconstitutional is because they knew you weren't really going to be meditating, you were really going to be praying. That's what they basically said in that decision. Lee versus Wiseman, 1992, the court prohibited clergy-led prayer at middle school graduation ceremonies. Santa Fe ISD versus Doe, that ban was extended to student-led prayer at high school football games. You see what they're doing? They're pushing all vestiges of Christianity and, and truth and, and absolute truth. They're pushing it out of our public institutions. American society changed drastically. Supreme Court decisions essentially banned the Christian consensus from public education, replacing it with secular humanism. The Christian consensus ban in America. For over 70 years, history of public schools has been revised to reflect a Marxist humanist worldview and produce a particular type of citizen who will embrace Marxist humanist ideals. How successful has this humanist propaganda campaign been in our public schools throughout the United States? More than 80% of voters under 30 years old voted for Bernie Sanders in the, in the 2016 primary, Democratic primary. He is an avowed socialist. So is Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the latest Marxist zealot elected to Congress. Her Green New Deal would ban oil, gas, coal, etc., and force all Americans to convert to so-called clean energy in 10 years. And if you understand anything about this, it's not really clean. There's so much industrial race from all these batteries and everything they're going to have to produce. It's, it's phenomenal. According to the Washington Post, Sakat Chakraborty, Ocasio-Cortez's chief of staff, stated, listen very carefully to this quote. The interesting thing about the Green New Deal is it wasn't originally a climate thing at all. We really think of it of how do you change the entire economy thing. They're lying to you about the climate change issue so they can convince you that we need to give them power over our cars, our houses, our transportation, our jobs, everything to save the planet. And they're brainwashing the kids so badly in public schools, they'll go home and say, Mom and Dad, don't you dare buy another car with gasoline engine. Our kids are scared to death. Chicken little, the sky is falling. And it's all a bunch of lies. And, it's, and they, don't, they don't care anything about the environment. They're using that as an excuse to get control of our economy. See, the Marxists, the traditional Marxists, failed to stir up strife in the economic uh, arena in America because you, you, there were no real classes in America. If you worked your tail off, you could rise and become a rich man. So they couldn't, they couldn't push the, the uh, class envy they did in other countries to gain power. So now what are they doing? They're pitting us against each other in other ways race wars, environmental situation. The Marxists are behind all this, folks. 44% of millennials would rather live in a socialist state with 7% would rather live in a communist country. Millennials are the least opposed to communist ideology when compared to other age groups. Prayer, Bible reading, and the Ten Commandments have been banned in public schools and replaced with secular humanist thought. We've gone from this to this in public schools. So how has American society changed since the early 60s when the Marxist humanist ideology took control? Criminal arrest of teens is up 150%. Suicide, teen suicides up 450%. Drug activity, illegal drugs up 6,000%. Child abuse cases up 2,300%. Divorce is up 350%. SAT scores continue to plummet, even though the questions have been revamped to be easier to answer. And they've renormed the tests. One in four parents living with a child in the United States today are unmarried. Okay, Less than half a century ago, fewer than one in ten parents living with children were unmarried. And most of those were widows or widowers. States with a higher percentage of out-of-wedlock births have a higher incidence of poverty. And 72% of adults were married in 1960. Only 51% of adults are married today. 
Hey, listen, one of the main reasons God gave us marriage, okay, men and women meet each other's needs in a marriage, all right? Think about this, not to be crass, but in the early 1960s, if a man wanted to be intimate with a woman, what did he do? He got married, amen? And when a woman wanted financial security and, and, and somebody to be secure and, and protect her and her children, what did she do? She got married, right? So what does feminism and hedonism get? Those are two other of the isms, by the way, devilisms. What did feminism and hedonism give us? A culture where a guy can go down to a bar and have sex with a woman any Friday night with no responsibility. And a woman is encouraged to go to college and work outside the home so she doesn't need that man. That's why that statistic is what it is today, folks. Two percent of Americans had no religious affiliation in 1960. Fourteen percent today do not identify with any religion. Here's a snapshot of American culture before the decline of the Christian consensus. The Andrew Griffith Show is one of my family's favorite shows. We watch it almost every night. Now, it's not perfect. There's some bad stuff in there on, on, on rare occasion, but it gives you a picture of what, what was it like in America under the Christian consensus. That's a good show to watch. Father Knows Best, some of those old 1950s sitcoms. And one of my favorite movies is The Wonderful Life. If you want to see what the Christian consensus was like, watch that movie. I know it's not theologically sound. You don't die and become an angel. Okay? That's just screwy. That's what that is. That's screwy. I guess not many of you watched uh, Jimmy Stewart in this movie, but that was, that was my best Jimmy Stewart. Usually I get some laughs, but you guys are, are poor of spirit because you have never seen It's a Wonderful Life. So go rent uh, Winchester 73 or something. Okay. So these are good videos to watch to see what was, what was American life like under the Christ, Christian consensus, okay? There are two sides to a story, folks. If one side is attempting to use lies, manipulation, and force to keep you from hearing the other side, what does that tell you about them? By the way, that was, that was a, a, of all things, a homosexual conservative from Breitbart was going to go to Berserkley, I mean Berkeley, and give a speech, and the whole community rioted and said, no, this man will not speak here. And the mayor, who's also a Marxist, just told the police, stand down. And they just went ahead, and, the, and the rioters, just like this last summer, police were told to stand down. People's businesses destroyed, cars destroyed, lives taken. Today you have learned some well-documented historical facts. Marxists and humanists often attempt to discredit those exposing these facts. They'll use terms for people like me. They'll call me a bigot, a hater, a fascist. So we learned today what the Founding Fathers believed and what changed in America. So what can be done about all this? Number one, repent of your sins and be saved. Then no matter how things turn out down here, you're going to be with Christ in heaven forever. Number two, if you are a Christian, yield your life completely to Jesus Christ. You know, if you're born again, God has a ministry for you. Do you even know what your ministry is? If you're born again, you have spiritual gifts. Do you even know what your spiritual gifts are? God didn't save you so you could warm up a pew. He saved you to do work for Jesus Christ. What are you doing for Christ? You know what? There was a time in my life where I'd have to sit there and go, oh, gee, I don't know. Just like most people in churches. But if those most people in churches get active and start yielding their lives to Christ, think of what we could do to transform America for Jesus. And be a light for Christ in this dark world by living for him and letting him live through you. Share the gospel so others can be saved. When the majority of Americans are Christians again, embracing Christian, a Christian consensus, then we'll be able to reverse the secular humanist damage that has been done to our nation. God will be able to bless America again. I believe God is chastening America again. I believe God's hand of chastening is upon us. I believe that's why we have the wicked man in the White House that we have. By the way, you need to pray for him to get saved. Every night when I pray with my family, I pray this prayer. Lord, we pray for all the politicians in America, from the president down to the lo local politicians, and for all the judges in America, from the Supreme Court all the way down to the local judges. Lord, we pray that they will rule by biblical principles and biblical morality. And Lord, if they will not do that, we pray they'll be saved. And Lord, if they will do neither of those, we pray you will smite them and remove them from office. Every night, the five of us hold hands in our prayer circle, and that's one of the prayers we pray. Unless the American Christians are willing to sacrifice as our founding fathers did, all is lost. 
By the way, we are very close. Would you be willing to pledge to Christ your life, your fortune, and your sacred honor? We're Daniel Charlotte Ministries, sharing the gospel with the lost and calling God's people to yieldedness. We appreciate your prayers and support. Please visit our table after you leave and take a prayer card. And again, I apologize for not being lubby-dubby with you, but just, you know, I'm trying to, trying to protect my wife. So hopefully we can come back another time and we can do all that stuff. So thank you.